provides network services on GIS and PA and PA tracking. Thank you very much, Ludo. The floor is yours. Thank you, Carol. Um, I'm, I'm pretty uh, pretty honored that I, I'm talking on this webinar today. I see a, a big group of people attending. It will probably uh, be a broad audience ranging from people who have a lot of GIS experience to people who have barely any knowledge about GIS. So um, in this first talk, I will just bring everyone up to the same level. Uh, what is GIS? What is web GIS? And how can that be used in ocean advocacy? Um, what kind of restrictions are there or limitations, things that we should take into account. And after that, I would like to zoom in a little bit on the, on the divide we see uh, in the GIS community between technical specialists and between policy uh, experts. And I'll wrap up that with some key recommendations for using and assessing GIS tools. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the, in, in, in the question box uh, from the webinar. Uh, uh, I and Carol uh, will, uh, will answer them there and in the end, uh, the Q&A, we will select some key questions. It's also the same for the upcoming presentations. Please, I encourage you all to, to type in your questions as we go, as you have them, and we'll get back to them. So um, keep on asking. Back to the presentation, um, what, what is GIS? Um, I, I can tell you a lot about that, uh, but, but first I want to go one step back. Um, this is what we call the, the, the data information pyramid, uh, and it's, it's just some general background. Uh, people get sometimes confused between what is the data in itself, is nothing more, nothing less than raw information. You know, that could be the sea surface temperature near Madagascar. That could be data, but it doesn't tell you anything unless you bring it up to higher level into knowledge. Uh, geographic information tools is all around finding relations and patterns and knowledge. Then we get to information. A point on the map is just data. It, it, it's not GIS. Um, all these points together, they can tell you something. That could be information. And even if you look into the patterns in that information, it can give you some knowledge, like what is happening in my environment. Um, Within GIS, we, we, we typically split this up per layer. Um, you see here a terrestrial example where we split up the infrastructure, protected areas, species, and so on and so on. And that gives us an approximation of the real world ecosystem. It helps us to understand the real world ecosystem better. So we split it up so we can better uh, uh, assess what's going on in our ecosystem. And patterns and relationships, the geographic information systems, and going back to that data part again, uh, all GIS systems, and I think this is for people who have experienced GIS know this by heart, um, but it's good to understand for the rest of this webinar. Um, if I have a list of, of points, X and Y points, um, in itself it's, 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 it's just data, but sometimes you know, all these points can be uh, linked together into a line. For example, if I have a list of observations of a ship, when I put them together it can be, uh, become a line and a shipping track. We can even go towards polygons, for example, the delineation of protected areas, they have multiple points. Uh, at least three, but more likely to be four or five or more uh, on where a certain area is, is protected or not. So, so this is what we call vector data. Uh, um, there's also something like raster too much grid the ocean and start reading values in, in that grid. It's uh, uh, for people who have GIS background, this is really GIS 101 but it's, it's important to understand if we take it further. Sometimes I get this question like GIS, it's, it's, it's been around since the 70s, since the 80s. It's, uh, it's, it's as long around as, as computers. Um, 
So if you look at the picture on the left, that's probably how some of you still uh, still know GIS. Um, but nowadays, it's uh, it's becoming more and more accessible. Uh, we even have Google Maps. We have web interfaces, web GIS. Uh, almost everyone in this webinar has a GIS system in their pocket called a mobile phone. We had a, a set of documents and that's that's mainly static. But now we're our PDF which is pretty static versus a website which is interactive. Um, you see that same movement with maps. Uh, 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 um, you used to have your maps and towards web mapping, uh, map services, dynamic interaction, near real-time data. That's where we're going. So that's the thing that's uh, making GIS new and more relevant uh, nowadays in, 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 in the technological era we're living in. Um, for example, and this is just one of the examples where, uh, where Beth, our second presenter, will go into more detail. You know, if, if you want to know something about a specific area, you just go to that area. And for example, you click on it, you only get a selection of the data that you're asking. Uh, and that's the good thing about a service. You ask a service something, and it delivers you certain information. It's not that you need to scroll through the yellow pages to find that information. No, you just ask, and you get an answer. And that's the biggest difference between a service and traditional uh, documents. Uh, so, and that's what we're seeing in WebGIS. WebGIS is all about interactiveness, all about querying data. So what are the restrictions? You know, because it, it, it sounds pretty good and it sounds pretty exciting, um, but there are also a lot of restrictions. And I think here uh, is, is something you all should be aware of if, if people start talking about GIS and GIS applications. There are just a few simple things um, that you should be aware of because a map always looks like it's true, but there's there's some things to take into account. For example, I went online and I was looking for some data, and I, I came to our site of colleagues of uh, UNF WCMC, and they have a great data set on on uh, mangroves, which I which I used in another uh, uh, research uh, working on. Um, but when you zoom in, you clearly see that uh, scale is is a one important thing in, in in interactive GIS systems because people they can zoom around, go to a higher level and to a lower level, but still people see a black and white border, basically. You go across the border and then something is not mangrove anymore. So if you zoom in here, data ask yourself the question for, uh, for what is this data meant and how is this data going to be used? Because interpreting it, a data is set like this on a very local scale is web analysis uh, coverage. So this is one of the questions I get a lot of times when there's a new tool presented. What does it mean to us? And whenever there's a global tool available, people ask me, well, what does this mean for the North Sea? And then my response is, sorry, but it's, it's not applicable on the scale level of the North Sea. So you should be able to, to ask these questions. And it sounds pretty simple and basic, but it's a key question because else you start to draw wrong conclusions, uh, on, which seems to be true on the map, but actually is not. In addition, you have projection. Um, so that's, uh, projection is probably something most of the people are not really aware of, but when they see some examples, they will understand that because they're the world is not flat. It's, it's, it's a sphere, obviously, and there's, it's difficult to represent the sphere on a flat surface. So that's why they try to project that map on flat surfaces. There are multiple ways of doing that. You see some examples on the left hand of your screen. Um, but depending on this projection, the shape of your map and the shape of your uh, coordinate grid will change. So um, just an example, if you have a, a drifting buoy on the ocean, which captures every hour the temperature, you get a, a, a nice set of point data. You get you get data points. 
uh, but when, once you want to put them in a the line, the line can be different uh, because the projections can be different as well. So the points are fixed, but the, the distance between those points, uh, it, it can look different on, on different uh, projections. And I think one of the most famous examples is the Mercator projection uh, where you see Greenland as big as Africa on the map, uh, which you see on the left. But if you actually make it to the right scale, you see that Greenland is just really small compared to Africa. So that's one of the bigger distortions you're going to have with projection. And that's, that's also one key thing to note if you're working on a, a global scale level versus a regional scale level, especially if you're working in higher latitudes in Arctic or Antarctic areas. You get a lot of distortion with, with projection. Another thing is uh, accuracy. Uh, most of you are already aware of, of accuracy of numbers and statistics, uh, but there's also something like spatial accuracy. Um, for example, if I want to map the coral reefs, um, on the left you see you all obviously coral reef, and on the right you see nothing at all, just sand. Um, but the world isn't black and white, unfortunately. Uh, there will be uh, parts where you will see some coral uh, on the landscape. So, so then there's the question, where do you draw the line? Uh, and uh, simple questions like, is there coral, yes or no, um, are actually not really yes or no questions. And that's a difficulty uh, to answer spatially. Because once you draw a border, uh, it's black and white. Uh, and sometimes people interpret this as well as black and white. And unfortunately, nature is not black and white. So those are some of the key restrictions we, we see in geospatial data, and it's always the questions you should ask when you see uh, a, a GIS tool presented to you. Um, now I want to make a, a, a short sidestep, and, and that's uh, something I uh, encounter a lot in my work. It's the divide between technical GIS specialists, in this case, uh, and less technical people, let's assume in this case policy specialists, I, I see a big divide over there and um, just want to briefly uh, illustrate that because the GIS specialist is mostly born in, in, the, in the scientific domain. They have a traditional schooling in statistics, uh, uh, geography, uh, geoinformatics or, uh, or some other uh, hardcore uh, science study area. So that's where they start. Their, um, their perspective on understanding data can be totally different. Uh, sometimes a, a scientist can think, well, if we prove um, that human activity is causing severe damage in that area, then we're done. You know, Then we make the proof and then it's obvious. Um, but uh, people uh, working on uh, policy experts know that's not the answer to your question. Sometimes you just obviously know there's something wrong. Uh, but no matter what kind of evidence you pull up, it's not going to change the world. Um, so the policy people, uh, it's how to call it, they, they've been in science around probably when they're studying, but it's, it's been a long time, uh, mostly. And they, they don't get around all the technical know-how and technical details what the GIS specialist has, like, for example, the accuracy, scale levels, and projections. Um, so, 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 so that can be a big divide. And then we have a third uh, a party involved, is, is the public, who doesn't know anything at all uh, about any of these uh, things. But they, they should be well informed because they can be a major stakeholder in your process. So um, some of the people recognizing these three circles uh, know what I'm after. Uh, and that's especially, uh, speaking from an NGO perspective here, is, is where we come in as boundary workers. We are there to make sure that the policy part understands the science and vice versa. That's not new to all of you. Um, but what we should do internally is, 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 is try to work multidiscipl multidisciplinary to make sure that the, the, the scientists who are working on the data understand your policy problem so that they can align their analysis with your policy problem. Uh, and on the other hand, from the policy perspective, you should know what's possible uh, from from a science side, yes or no. I see a lot of debate in, in this in this area and mostly it's just getting these people together and how simple that may sound, reality is often not the case. You you send a TOR, terms of reference to a university to conduct a study, you get results and uh, sometimes these results are not that easy to interpret and you end up with a nice piece of science which gets published 
um, but it doesn't uh, does not get that far uh, in the policy landscape as you had hoped. So it, it sounds pretty simple, but you should be aware from the start to 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 make, to save that integration between uh, science policy but also towards, towards the public. Wrapping that up, um, I, I summarized a few key recommendations for using GIS tools. Um, and Let's start with, with, with uh, one of the biggest errors I see is, is don't build massive libraries of data. Um, I see people have this tendency to collect things, you know, collect as much as possible data, make it a, a massive one-stop library which has everything. Um, it, it's a great ambition and ideally, yes, uh, that, that's, it's good in most of the cases, um, but in reality you're not going to be able to keep up with, uh, with keeping that whole library up to date. Uh, so. I should focus on uh, the, only the, the data and information you need for your specific purpose. Don't make it an, uh, an extreme big library of data. And that's, that's the same for the tooling you put on the web GIS. If you want to have all these fancy analysis, that, that's great for a GIS specialist. And um, I mostly see GIS people making this error like, hey, we're going to build a tool that does everything from a GIS perspective. Um, but these dual tools don't exist um, because it confuses your end user. So keep it simple. So uh, only stick to the data you need and only stick to the tooling you need. Don't make it too complicated. And uh, those two add up to, to the third lesson is really don't overload your viewer. I see some really nice geospatial information uh, applications online which have tons of data but if you need uh, a week of training to start using it, then, then only one or two people uh, uh, will use it. Uh, so, so you should make sure uh, that it's simple and it's really telling your story. As a GIS specialist, you should be from the start. Uh, uh, keep this in mind to not overload your, your target audience. And, but but it's, it's, a, it's a tricky one because mostly when you're in the process of building something, you always see nice things to add. You learn about, hey, nice data set from from these other people, let's add it too. It's, it's nice to have. It's, I think it's not but what's nice to have, but what you really need, uh, not the nice to have things, lose those. Also, you should be aware of, of the scale. You know, if you're making an application which is uh, for, the, for worldwide analysis, don't start interpreting them regionally. Um, for example, there, 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 there are some big institu research institutions who make big uh, global data sets and there is also sort of over focus on having everything global. Um, sometimes it just doesn't add up to the regional context. So be aware of the scale. If you're making an application just for your, uh, for your own region, um, be, be aware of pulling in uh, worldwide scale data sets and vice versa. And again, final lesson, aim for this transdisciplinarity. Uh, get the people involved and in the same room from start. From, from start, you should uh, get them talking together. Because if you uh, start a study by, uh, by sending a term of reference to a university and interpret that later, um, then, then probably you're going to end up with a result what you don't need. So aim for transdisciplinarity. So thanks. For, uh, for your attention and this fed into account when you're, you're looking at tools. Um, now we're moving into more uh, uh, an applied side and we're going to have uh, uh, Beth and Andrea speaking right after me. Um, so, so Beth is, has a really nice example uh, uh, of, of, of a mapping tool online, MP Atlas. Um, so um, I'm hereby going to give the word to, uh, to Beth to, uh, to, to, to de demonstrate what MP Atlas can do, and um, up to you, Ben. All right, thank you, Vudo. All right, let's see. And Beth, yeah, I just transferred it. Okay. All right, can you guys? Yep, we're okay. seeing your screen. All right, so my name is, great. So my name is Beth Pike, and I work for the Marine Conservation Institute. Uh, we are a US-based uh, nonprofit that does a lot of work in GIS, in fact, I think pretty much our entire science team of currently three people are all GIS uh, experts. And so a lot of what we do involves the spatial 
protection of the oceans uh, through a number of different tools, uh, a couple of which I really want to highlight with you today. Uh, the one that uh, we talk about the most and kind of our most high profile work is with the uh, npaatlas.org. And so I wasn't sure what the level was going to be of folks uh, as far as not knowledge on what MPAs are, but I'm sure most of you know that MPAs, though defined, uh, are still very widely defined. Uh, the definition leaves a lot of wiggle room. And so depending on the people uh, who are looking at the marine protected areas and what they include or don't include, the numbers can vary widely. And it's becoming um, a bit of an issue in the community that our numbers don't always align. And a lot of that has to do with uh, what you call an apple, what you call an orange, and what you call uh, and so forth. And so the numbers can vary quite a bit. And so we know that MPAs are a powerful cons conservation tool. They are place-based and hopefully comprehensive and ecosystem-based. And so but what we also know is that we're pretty slow on our pace of implementing them. There's a number of different global goals that are out there um, as far as what percent of the oceans ought to be protected and by what time. Uh, there's a 2008 study that estimated that our current pace was going to yield about a 35-year timeline to get to 10%. And so we know that we need to speed this up. So. So in this, you can see the top left is our existing MPA landscape. Uh, then if you move to the right, you can see added in there MPAs that have been proposed or that were designated and not implemented. And then below, you can see sort of what's the current percentage of 30%. Uh, most people seem to be coalescing around the idea that 10% was really a good starting point, but we all knew we didn't want to just hit 10% pat ourselves on the back. And so um, this 30 by 2030 is starting to become something that folks are focusing on. And this is just a completely abstract kind of look at what that would actually look like. So you can see we have quite a ways to go from the top left to the bottom. Um, most people here will probably also understand that the names are not standardized. And so there's lots of things that are called an MPA. However, um, as most people will recognize, just saying something's a marine protected area uh, doesn't necessarily translate to the person you're telling it to as what you mean it to be. So when the MBAs work, well, uh, there's kind of a landmark study by Ed Kurdahl that pointed out that at least four or five markers really need to be met in order for an MPA to meet an effectiveness bar, uh, among them being uh, the prohibition of fishing, enforcement, uh, length of protection or age, uh, size, and isolation from impact. Uh, so we know that within these reserves, you do see an increase in diversity and abundance, and that the biodiversity uh, also benefits from the lack of impact and extraction from humans. However, um, we do have the WDPA, which is the Global Database and Official Repository. Uh, the MPA data that is sent to them comes from official government sources. Uh, in the U.S., it's actually the USGS, the, the Geographic Service, that sends in MPA information, uh, although we do have an MPA center. Uh, and the WDPA actually is not able to uh, add or change the data in any way. So they are basically taking all of the data from around the world and hosting it and doing the, the bulk of the work to try and do that. Uh, however, as a third party, we are actually able to kind of nuance that visualization uh, with the recognition that not all MPAs are actually the same on the water. So this is a map of uh, the WDPA database as it currently stands, or most recent one anyway. Uh, one thing I'll point out is the number of MPAs around Australia. There's also a number of MPAs identified in the United States in the Gulf Coast area, in the Southeast US, as well as up around Alaska. 
And here is our map. Uh, so you can see it's a lot more information there. So what you're seeing are green areas, which are uh, effectively no-take areas, places where fishing is not allowed. Uh, there are yellow areas, which are MPAs where a portion of the marine protected area has been established as a no-take area. And then there are blue areas where either there is no take or we are not yet sure. The other thing you'll see is that there are places where there's hash marks through the MPAs. And what this is is MPAs that are designated or proposed but do not yet uh, have any management plan or any sort of regulation uh, on the water. And so that big area around Alaska suddenly looks a lot different uh, when you realize that most of those protections are not yet, yet in place. So we created the MP Atlas as a tool to try and help uh, the community get uh, more nuanced information around the type of protection that's actually there. There are targets that everybody kind of know about. Currently we have a 20, um, 2020, 10% by 2020 deadline from the conservation um, in, of bioconservation, forget the CBD, I always use the words, but the um, conservation on biodiversity. And so what we have here is a little dashboard where we're trying to take a look at what we actually have for MPAs established, what's proposed, and how much further we would need to get to reach 10%. This is our online map, and I'll switch over actually to the website here in a little bit. I just wanted to kind of walk through some of the uh, web pages while I knew that I would be able to view them, just so we didn't have any snafus. Uh, so this is our home page. This is the home map. And you can see on the sidebar there the numbers captured for the amount of protection globally broken down by all marine protected areas as well as no-take marine reserves. We've also added the amount of proposed MPAs, both uh, globally and within national jurisdictions. We also provide a map gallery. Through our work, we're often creating versions of this data for different audiences. And so what we try to do is keep uh, a set of our latest and greatest maps on our website that are updated periodically. These are all available to the community for download and use as they need as they would need them. We also do include non-MPA information. Uh, we feel that uh, things such as shark sanctuaries, for example, already have a certain amount of protection, uh, certainly for sharks in those areas. And so species within those regions. And we want to identify them as places where some work has been done, some groundwork has been done, and potentially more work could push them into kind of an official MPA status, uh, some more regulation or some more uh, access or extraction prohibitions might actually then pull it to uh, the level of a marine protected area. And so we identify these areas for uh, the purposes of the community to identify potential places uh, where new MPAs might be able to exist. Uh, we also have done some work in the high seas, identifying places that have been closed to deep sea bottom trawl fisheries, uh, as well as overlaying that with depths at which the fish, the fishing could actually occur. So um, what we did in the map on the right is an overlay with the blue areas being places that bottom trawling could actually reach the bottom. And then over that are red areas where uh, bottom trawling is then prohibited. Uh, the green areas are places that were previously fished and remain uh, available for fishing. And so uh, this type of analysis can take points and polygons and regulations and kind of align them so you get a visual look at, at what type of protection is really in existence there. of the general public that might come through and want to uh, learn more about how they can help with different 
uh, types of. We also have a page on there that is tracking the targets that are out there for different uh, nations as well as region. And so this kind of culminated in the uh, realization that we also needed to create a tool to kind of help the community track all of these various efforts. Uh, lots of different nonprofits and uh, governmental agencies and local communities have done a lot of work to try and get protection in different parts of the world, not all of which actually exist as uh, MPAs yet. And so what we've done is create something we call a campaign tracker. And you can see here on the top right that uh, this is essentially kind of a point-based data set because frequently the boundaries are not yet established or haven't been put out uh, as, as the final word yet. Uh, but in these areas, there are efforts. Now, these efforts can range from uh, they're, they're really, really close to having an MPA. They just need one or two more things to kind of pie in the sky uh, areas that have been identified as important and somebody should do something. Uh, so this isn't all the same level of effort. But uh, what we wanted to do was try to create a place where organizations and groups that are working in similar areas might identify each other and maybe work together or find ways to kind of align their goals uh, so that we can try and further the pace of uh, MPA designation. And so this pie chart here actually shows the amount of existing MPAs and existing no-take marine reserves versus all of the things that you may have heard about or know about that are either still only proposed or that they're designated and not yet implemented. And so you can see there's a number of things on here. For instance, New Caledonia's National Natural Park of the Coral Sea is currently being implemented, but is not yet fully implemented. Um, and so we try to track them and then move them into the existing column when we uh, learn that they've been implemented or they've switched over to a change on the water. Uh, you can also map this. Uh, this is a map that we update from time to time showing proposed areas. And you can see that the um, current amount of proposed area would actually add 3.7% uh, to the amount of no-take. So it would be a significant increase. You can see there's actually also a number of efforts down around Antarctica as well. And so is the rate increasing? Uh, it looks as though it might be. Uh, this is a chart we did. It's not. Uh, it's very rough draft. We're doing it for a current uh, work that we're doing. And you can see that the old uh, trend line there in purple had us um, taking a lot longer to get to 10%. Uh, you can see in blue what uh, looks like could be the new trend line. It might uh, begin meeting some of these goals, you can see it's unlikely we'll hit 10%. This look as though that line is moving up. Uh, the, another initiative of the Marine Conservation Institute is work to try and identify different regions within the ocean using all of the available uh, classification uh, efforts that have gone on. Uh, this one is the Global Open Oceans and Deep Seabed classification, but there's a number of these. And what we're trying to do is um, overlay those with existing and proposed marine protected areas uh, because most people understand the ocean has different regions, not all are, not all are going to be the same, and current efforts um, are highly concentrated in remote areas that tend to be tropical, kind of places, and so we're, we may be missing some more important regions of the ocean that need protection. And so we're trying to uh, implement a global ocean refuge system where we give um, recognition to MPAs that provide protection in areas that maybe are less or protected uh, and things of that nature. And so we do put out a series of reports uh, using this data. We have for, uh, few years now, I've been putting out a sea states report looking at 
um, the actual no-take area within the United States. Uh, no-take uh, areas have been identified as, as quote-unquote the gold standard of marine protected areas. And so uh, when you're looking for real effective, strongly protected MPAs, uh, these are the things you certainly want to keep an eye on. And so these reports are designed to do that. Uh, we've um, also done them regionally. Uh, this spring we released one in partnership with uh, some colleagues in Canada and Mexico to identify the progress in North America. And also internationally, a couple years ago we did um, a comparison of the G20 countries uh, as well to look at the amount of no-take that they were putting. And all of these top uh, three countries have the bulk of their no-take strongly protected marine reserves in areas uh, that are not close to their mainland, so they're in remote areas uh, or holdings or territories. And so even in the high seas, as I mentioned, um, we are helping to track progress uh, and effective amounts of protection in those areas uh, through the uh, work that we've done in partnership with the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition as well as the High Seas Alliance. And uh, this atlas that we've hosted online, and it's on our MP Atlas website as well, um, allows you to kind of zoom in and zoom out, uh, identify different uh, things of interest. So we've started overlaying things such as areas of particular environmental interest by the International Seabed Authority, which are uh, mining specific areas that are set aside as protected from mining activity. So we're expanding out from just deep sea fisheries to other extractive uses and trying to include those in this atlas so that uh, we can get a more accurate look at where there might be um, some need for further protection. Oh, I know what I'm doing. So I uh, brought this up because I wasn't sure if the website was going to work on this connection. Uh, but it allows you to do different base maps on the back. So depending on what your emphasis is or what you're needing this information for, you can change the base map. You can also print out a version of this map so you can select the layers that you want to show and create a map uh, customized to your needs. And you can share this map as well. So uh, there is an ability to link to it and share it with others uh, if you would want to. And we're certainly looking to move more of our data towards this type of interface. And so uh, we have more than 11,000 marine protected areas in the database and it's very difficult to stay on top of all of them. And so this is my kind of plea to anyone uh, who wants to help us. We want all the information uh, that we can get, and we're always looking for folks that have expertise in different regions, uh, whether it be MPA or regional specific, to reach out to us, uh, to give us any feedback on the information that you see in our atlas. Uh, we always welcome that type of feedback. I just want to say thank you to many of our partners. Uh, we could not do this uh, without the work of all of these groups and, and more. It's really just a, a, a giant community effort, and we appreciate everyone's help and support. And so with that, I think I will wrap it up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Beth. Uh, um, and thank you for, uh, and for all of you who have been asking questions. Thank you very much also for forwarding your questions. We'll get to them either in the Q&A session or we will answer them online. Um, and also just to, uh, to, to, to remind everybody, the, the email address that Beth shared was info at mpaalice.org. Ana Carolina, you already had some nice uh, new information to share with her, so do forward it to her uh, via info at mpaalice.org. So I'm going to pass it over to Ludo, who will be introducing Andreas from Navama. Yes, thanks, uh, Carol. Uh, up next is uh, uh, Andreas Struck uh, from Navama based in Munich. Uh, Andreas is doing some great work on interpreting uh, AIS DMS data to, to derive uh, fishing density products. Um, he's absolutely uh, leading this world. He's, he's really, really good in, in, in this type of analysis uh, and he's uh, going to further introduce him and, and share a lot about this uh, exciting um, tool he has developed. So uh, Andreas, uh, the words up to you. Thank you Ludo for introducing me. Thank you to the audience to listen to us. Um, um, 
can when when you start with GIS work, he asked you to focus, and I fully can con, uh, support this approach. But I tell you one thing: today or now, you will hear about tremendous amount of data, and that's exactly the challenge which we will address. How can you handle uh, big databases and to um, see here um, contexts which are important for marine protection? Uh, for doing this, we developed together with WWF for years already a kind of technology which allows satellite-based marine resource management for nature. And the product which is now coming up is called Sea Ocean. It is an explorer web-based application for marine analytics and visualization. Very complex sentence, and I expect, and some will already start there. What set? What it is is that we bring data together, and in the core of our approach are uh, so-called AIS data, which is uh, yeah, a kind of anti-collision system, which nearly every large vessel, meanwhile, has in the world, and also a lot of fishery vessels. And this data we collect and and store in a database and bring it together with other information and try to analyze and visualize it. Uh, it is 100% web-based, so you don't need a local installation. Uh, this was mainly done from our side because we want also to have uh, people who has not the high performance workstations available, so in Africa, for example, they can use it. And it has a user right management based on vessels or regions, which tells you, which means that you can have your own view on your data. You can have, for example, not the global access. You can have only the access on Mediterranean Sea or only for 20 vessels. The background for this is there are sometimes costs behind the data, uh, and, and to keep these costs as low as possible for you. In addition. To this, uh, because we, we did come to the conclusion, it's not only AIS uh, which if has an effect, uh, also signals from vessels with AIS has an effect on nature, it's also so-called VMS signals, so we extended our database that it has now also real-time interfaces with VMS systems, and uh, we extended the system also, if you have a fishery who is using some GPS devices from smartphone or Mekomo, Opcom, Global Star, whatever, uh, you can also link this data flows to the system so that you can see this information. And very new now, and those who know our platform already will be maybe a bit surprised, we do not only work on historical data, we work now also on real-time data. So we have real-time information all around the globe of probably 60% of all vessel movements for nature conservation. Uh, having all these vessels now in the database, which ends up in a huge database, uh, is fun, but it's only half of the story. Uh, what we add then to make this, and Ludo says it's very nice in the introduction, you have data, but you have to make out information or even the knowledge or even wisdom out of it, so we combine this uh, vessel data, vessel track data with GIS information. And here I was really impressed by Beth's presentation and I noted already I will send her an email for some questions and help or ideas. Uh, we have water depths in our database, something like coral reefs, sea mounts, seagrass, EZs, world database of protected areas. Uh, important for you is to know that you can extend this set of GIS information with your own information, to link it with this large database of vessel movements. So it's not a limited a set which is in the tool. It allows you in a special project to add also your own individual information for first analytics. Saying this, it's not only the vessel tracks and the GIS information. We add in addition information from other satellites like a wind or wave, which we get also in, 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 in real time into our database. And you can combine then in mathematical analytics the vessel tracks, the GIS information is in a polygon or is not in a polygon with wind situation, wave and other information uh, or was this vessel in a port or did he turn off his IS device to get a, a complete view of uh, 
of, uh, of pressure in the marine region. This is now a lot of data and is the opposite of what Ludo recommended to do, but it's a typical data and it's optimized for marine management. So we, our focus is on marine management and what do you need on information for marine management. Um, having this all in the database, we extended it now also with live data, so you can click on a vessel. Now you see it here when you look on the map. You can click on a vessel and then you can ask for the track and then you see the full track and you can then ask for analytics of this track, how deep was the water at this point or how fast was it driving or you can do first analytics on did it turn off his IS device or not. Uh, or was it driving slowly, was it driving uh, back and forward to get a, a, a full picture. Uh, this is the Sea Ocean Explorer and this is a tool who should help you to do uh, on a large data set analytics and combine it with your information and you can also download tracks to your, uh, to your GIS application for better visualization. And I show you now a little bit what we did with partners to analyze uh, data sets which we got from them and we combined it with our knowledge and then we brought up some conclusions. And this is a kind of service which we do in addition to the ocean. For example, here was the question of about 40 NSC certified vessels which you can find on every uh, food package. Uh, how much do they have an effect on cold water corals? Is there something that uh, the standard can be improved? And we looked then on the vessel movements, on the coral reefs and analyzed speed and weather conditions at this moment and then we talked to the guys of the fisheries and told them they should do here a bit, be a bit more careful if you have an issue. Or here was a request uh, that somebody has had uh, from turtles, uh, the, the moving patterns, and we combined this with the whole oil and tanker movements in, in, in the Gulf, Persian Gulf and looked if there are uh, effects, are there risks, can, can uh, marine protectors be uh, uh, managed better or can be given recommendations for, 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 for protected areas. Here, and this is a very interesting work, we looked the same, not on turtles, but on whales and we cooperate here with a team who, who shares with us their whale movements and then we look on vessel traffic and try to develop models combined with uh, oil consumption of these vessels. Is it better to make a curve around uh, a region to protect, for example, whales or is it better to drive slowly and we model here also speed and effect of carbon dioxide exhaustion. Interesting is it was better to drive a curve but to slow down the vessel and we will work on this first in the future. Here we did, for example, an analysis. The question was more or less uh, how much is Europeans uh, food consumption, fish consumption affecting West African fishery. And there is one thing you look on the policy, what is allowed and what is not allowed. As there's another option, you look who is fishing in West African waters and where are they harboring uh, to, to, to reload, uh, up, unload the fish and this is a quite old work, now three years old, and here is all vessels who are actively fishing on West Africa and they are harboring in the southeast European harbor which was at, is, is, is uh, Gran Canaria. Here is a cooperation where we use data to visualize urbanization. Uh, this is a cooperation with Harvard University and I like this a lot with a student group. Their challenge is more or less to find different ways to show how urbanization affects nature, coastal lines, but also Pacific. And here we linked uh, the urbanization data with IIS data to show vessel and fishing activities. Uh, here you see a work where we used the data to look on effects uh, on the ice border. The challenge was uh, to, 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 to convince ma mainly retailers not to buy fish which is now, uh, can be catch, catch now in regions where the ice moves back. So we have uploaded in sea ocean all the ice uh, borders and looked on fishing activity to see is there a pressure already coming up 
uh, on, on regions where are becoming free and scientists has not yet fully understood what happens is. So we try now to work with uh, retailers here that say don't buy fish which comes from this region. Here you see a work which we did for German governments. They wanted to, 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 uh, to give new rules for marine protected areas in Baltic Sea. And here we did some analysis with them together on the pressure. Is this really a problem or not? Uh, here you see a picture which we use, and because there comes very often the question, if you we, because we use uh, a lot of data which are not designed to be transparent or to be available to show where vessel is, it's more let's say garbage from information which falls away from anti-collision systems, etc. Yeah, what is if somebody is not using an IES device, and we developed an algorithm who allows us to to get an understanding that we have a receipt a problem with our signals or do we have a sender problem and using this app uh, algorithm for example in the Senegal waters you can see here uh, red lines which show there was uh, a problem from the send of the device and the research vessels which we use uh, as a reference in the same time in the same region has nearly no red lines so it, it did not have the sender problems. Uh, another work we did and where we can apply sea ocean and the data, here we have data points from completely unknown vessels in the beginning. It's not recognized as a fishing vessels and we have algorithms who, who select them in unknown data points. This was at Josephin Sea Mount, it's a deep sea area which has an um, important uh, protection status versus there was bottom drawing activity. And these are the results then from our algorithms who found ten vessels which are officially no fishing vessels but they were fishing vessels based on other database we identified then the vessels and uh, WWF could go back to some fisheries as also uh, governments and talk to them uh, and put some more pressure for a higher protection status. Um, saying that we use AIS data and VMS data in our database as we work also a lot with uh, food processors who buy fish and we want to change here the market by consumer behavior and we want to support still small scale fisheries. We develop at the moment uh, technology which allows low cost uh, position devices which you know probably from your smartphone also or from uh, uh, if you watch your dock you can buy something and similar devices we test from various hardware suppliers for small scale fisheries so that they can also share the position and we can create a better transparency. Here we did, it's now nearly a year ago, a project in Philippines with uh, seven different devices, third vessels and registered all their movements and we have now a recommendation for people who buy fish, what they can recommend uh, to their uh, vendors uh, to use if they have no position information for their vessels. Uh, that's basically my slides and because I want to ensure that it's not only slides that we, we, we talk here about a real application where you can ask for an account and use in your daily work, I give a very short demo only to the, um, to the Sea Ocean Explorer. First of all, Sea Ocean Explorer, just give me a second, when you log in, is a web application, as I said, which has uh, here overlays which we can use. We to put, for example, now EEZs, we put the water depth to the layer and we put, let's say, um, where is it, um, protected areas here. We put the protected areas uh, on it. Uh, nothing exciting. Um, the point comes now, we want to see now, I make it a little bit larger. Um, some vessels. Uh, I don't ask now because there are 107 listeners and maybe we come to a conclusion. We can take now any place in the world, any place, wherever we want to go. I go now, uh, because in the middle, I go to the Spanish coast here, for example. Then we ask to see uh, now the live data which we have in our database. Let me just check here, ah, yes, real time. 
we say we want to say is a fishing data and take it in a color. So now we have all vessels uh, which are fishing boats, registered fishing boats in Europe. This is quite good in Europe because there's a law which demands that every fishing boat down to 40 meters must have an AIS system. We can go now to one vessel, for example. We go, let's go here to the, uh, sorry. Second. Let's go to this one. You can ask which one is it. It is a Spanish vessel with a, a draught of 2.9 meter, length of 24 meters, and now we can ask to see the drag. Just add it to our drag database because it's not only real time what you see here now. We are adding now this drag. It's not only a real time what you see here in the background is loaded. Oh, it has no uh, history data. So let me look for another version. Sorry. Let's take this one. So it's now loading. Here for this vessel you have seen it has a tremendous amount of data. You see it has 15,883 data points. They go back to the 21st of July 2013 up to uh, May, uh, June this year. No? Uh, you can now look in depth to the vessel and if you are interested in this vessel in some patterns or whatever it is doing, you can add this vessel to a project and in this project you get some information about speed patterns, uh, IS on off uh, uh, patterns or water uh, depths over ground and can get a complete full picture. And if you need this data then for, for your local analytics you can download here this, I think it's this button here, yes exactly you can download the data CMF or KML file and use it in your uh, local GIS application for further analytics. That's basically the live demo of the Sea Ocean Explorer and what we can offer. And um, just let me. So after the live demo, uh, our partners at the moment, more tailors and fish processors who want to make sure that they buy fish which is uh, catched uh, uh, on a transparent and valuable way and, and respects, uh, for example, requirements which WWF is asking them to do, not to enter certain marine protected areas, etc., etc. That's it from my side. Thank you very much. I haven't looked on the time. Hope it was the right 20 minutes and I give it now back to Ludo and to, to open for discussions. Yes, uh, thanks Andreas. Uh, no worries, your timing was excellent. We have another 15 minutes for uh, questions and answers. We already have some questions and answers coming in, but I encourage you to, to type in your questions as we go. Um, Carol is sitting next to me and she has selected a few questions for either me and the other speakers. Um, so Carol, uh, could you give us a question and we'll answer. Thanks Ludo. Uh, thanks again to all the presenters for today's uh, webinar session. We had a couple of questions that were on a uh, more general nature which we have answered online. So do uh, click on the pop-up box uh, marked questions to see some of the results responses that we've already uh, put online, uh, put, uh, put up on uh, during the discussion. Um, here's a question now from Christian Novia Handayani. He asks, uh, we are often asked to analyze data to identify a high conservation area due to, a, due to an MPA proposal. And he says the problem is usually the distribution of the data is not very good. The data is often too patchy, only available in certain spots. Do you have any tool or suggestions to manage this kind of data? So I'm going to put the question forward to either Beth or Ludo or Andreas, if any of you have, a, have advice for Christian. I think I'll go off with a shot here and uh, uh, we'll see if anyone uh, can add to that. Um, I, I do fully understand your question, uh, Christian. I think in a lot of mostly research settings that's exactly what we encounter, uh, just small patches of data. Um, 
how I dealt with it in, in a few research projects is to, to, to see whether there's a, a modeling tool available for, for, for what you're what you're after and use that patch data to, to, to verify your, your model results. So if you cannot uh, um, get the full data coverage, find a way, either a proxy or, or a way to model it. Extrapolating spatially is, is uh, difficult and error prone, so I would, I would try to go for a simplified modeling exercise or a proxy and use your, uh, your patchy data to, to cross-check that whether, whether that fits. It's of course highly case dependent, so it's a pretty generic answer I'm giving you here. Um, but I hope it points in the in the right direction. Um, Andreas or Beth, anything to add to that? No, fine for me. Thanks. Yeah, we had a, we had similar challenges with the high seas work. Uh, it's uh, what the review we just recently did on the um, UN General Assembly uh, fisheries. Um, uh, work that we were, we were trying to look at whether RFMOs had actually looked at places where VMEs could be because clearly we don't know where all the VMEs are. It's a giant area and limited uh, and expensive to get to. And so we were only able to identify two global um, models for uh, predicting uh, VME habitat area. And they had, had some pretty bad limitations. For example, one didn't do anything in the Mediterranean or outside of the 60 degree latitude on either end. So uh, it is hard, but I would say um, it's always important to make sure that you are working with data that is, um, you know, doing the best job it can in the area that it is. But uh, more and more, a lot of management has best, pos uh, best management practices or best available data. And, and sometimes that's what you've got. Thanks, Beth. Um, I, I hope that answers your question, uh, Christian. Um, I see uh, the question coming in whether the slides are available. I just want to point out that the recording will be available on open channels, as well as the slides. We'll put them on mpaaction.org under the trainings section. So as well, the slides and the recording will be available. So, so, so no need to worry about that. Um, Carol, do you have another question for us? Yeah, I have a question specifically for you, Ludo. Um, if you'd like to read it out, please. Uh, it's from Dirha Daniel, and it's to do with WebGIS. Yes, I see a question, uh, Dirha Daniel. How can we generalize the data so that it can be seen clearly and give of good information to the user? And he's talking about um, uh, big data, big data web GISs, and that refers to my comment uh, at the start where I said, big, "Do not build big libraries." Um, I do want to emphasize that do not build big libraries, is specifically for lobby and, adv and advocacy purposes. Um, if you're if you're going to lobby uh, or advocate for a, for a specific purpose, then a big library doesn't help you because the person who's looking at it. Uh, does not know how to make cheese out of that. So, so it gets a lot of information and overloaded. So for lobby purposes, I would avoid big data. For, uh, but however, for governments, it can be pretty useful to have them because they have a lot of end users who will continue to use their data. Um, either way, it's, it's keeping your, your end goal in mind. Ask yourself the question, uh, why am I building this library and how is this going to change uh, or how is it going to achieve my goal? Um, I think we don't always have our theory of change ready for that. And it's, it's similar to, uh, uh, to, to another question uh, I, I got from uh, Elia Sabula uh, that I recommended not to build massive libraries. And it's a good question. What about libraries of information? Um, and that's referring to the data information pyramid. So, uh, so Again, here my, my answer would be, um, to who are you supplying this information? Um, sometimes the question should, should come from the end user perspective. Uh, and uh, what, what uh, GIS specialists tend to do, including myself, is to approach it from a GIS perspective where we have comprehensive data portals, because that's what we like to see. I see also a lot of questions on specific data sets. That's exactly how we as GIS specialists want to see it, but we should uh, start the debate with, with people uh, from our organizations or fellow organizations 
uh, what kind of information do they need? Because if we have a library full of information, but just not the information that they're after, um, yeah, then it's still becoming a big challenge. So, so, so try to place yourself on the other side and ask yourself the question: uh, How will this? How will this change? So, I hope that answers those questions. Uh, mostly, it's uh, also the question. Yeah, the question to the most the people had in here. Um, Reading through the questions, I see another one, and it's addressed for Andreas. Yes, uh, so I've got a question here from Andy Jeffrey for Andreas. Uh, firstly, very interesting presentation, Andreas, uh, particularly the way you're using real-time AIS data. He's wondering if you are aware of Watch, which is uh, put forward by Ocean and Google, or Eyes on the Seas by Pew and Satellite Applications Catapult projects. He's yeah. wondering if you're already aware or already working with these two other. Yeah. Thank you for this question. Uh, yes, I know them. I know this project, and we are also in, let's say, in a kind of loose contact and talk to each other. We plan in the future some more meetings to discuss it. Um, I think we are, all three started from different approaches to the problem, and they have all some advantages and disadvantages and our, our strengths and weaknesses. And so I think, uh, yeah, that's the answer. So I know them, we talk to each other, but we have not yet done any data sharing or the software development sharing, only uh, yeah, exchange of ideas and thoughts. Okay, thanks, Andreas. And, and that, just a question following that from Roy Martinez. Is the AIS data available for download to perform analysis in, uh, every, uh, in, uh, in people's computers uh, from, uh, from the general public? Uh, it's a following situation. AIS data has different sources. There are terrestrial AIS data and there are satellite AIS data. And satellite AIS data are, at least we pay license fee for them. And we can share them with WWF team because they uh, support this project and we do this development with them since five years together. Um, if somebody else wants to have an access to the ocean and wants to download data, uh, it depends on the kind of data. It's available technically. He can download every track and visualize it plus other information, but it depends a little bit then on licenses, so it must be decided case by case. Thanks, Andreas. Uh, th there's a lot more questions uh, for you. I think a lot of people are very interested in on, on, on how this works. Um, I have a question here from um, Jose Ingles, and his question is, uh, what's the confidentiality of AIS and VMS tracks? Often fishing companies treat their positions as trade secrets, ex uh, where exactly they're fishing and catching the fish. So how do you deal with that, Andreas? Ah, that's a good question. It's a challenging question, and I experienced everything since I present this. I talk to fisheries, I talk to retailers, I talk to NGOs, and everyone has a different view on this, of course, and you can imagine how the view looks. Uh, legally, it's allowed. Uh, it's a public available signal. There is no uh, constraint. Also, sometimes this right uh, that somebody tries to tell this, so there's nothing unlegal. Of course, you are not allowed to link this information with personal information, so like with a fisherman on board or something else, because then it is against European law, but only the vessel position is allowed. Um, we try to be a bit careful, uh, and what we try in our approach and the whole initiative, which WWF is also supporting, is called Transparency. So we try to motivate fisheries to be transparent. That's why we have all this close link to retailers and to consumers, and we want to promote the use and the buy of fish food, which is transparent. Uh, so we don't want it so much to hunt down bad guys, but we want to promote the good guys. Of course, uh, as, as a, as a large-scale data analytics tool, you can also see on the pressure which comes somehow then from bad guys on MPA. But we don't try to, to blame them or to tell them you've done something wrong. We try to talk to them. That's my answer. Thanks, Andreas. Um, uh, one more question. You briefly uh, touched on this in, in terms of access to the sea ocean. So some people are interested in getting access. How do they how do they get access to it and what, what is the procedure or process? Yes, the procedure is um, that they contact me uh, via the website or can send directly an email. 
then we talk usually shortly because we don't want to open this to everyone now and to, to trust that it's misused or whatever. And if, the, if it's an NGO, it's not a problem at all. If it's government, it's also not a problem at all. If it's private people, we need to be better to understand what is the purpose of the work. And then we can give a demo account to test it a little bit or we can give a presentation together in a webinar where we go in depth and explain it and then it depends on the region or the data he needs whether the, 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 uh, how much is license cost because we buy some of the data and has to forward system to our satellite data providers. Thanks, Andreas. I have uh, another question here from Arturo Carpaio. Uh, I think I'm, I'm hope, I hope I'm not butchering your name too much. It's a question Arturo. maybe for uh, Beth, <laughs> yeah, for Beth and uh, for Ludo. Um, Arturo's question is: What would you, what would you mention to be the basic elements for a successful marine governance model? Do you know of any other successful initiative for marine governance, especially in the high seas, other than the Sargasso Commission? Um, any uh, any response, maybe from Beth or from uh, from uh, from Ludo or from Andreas? Well, hey there, yeah. Beth. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> there is some. Um, well, you know, the, as we know, it's all kind of split up by use at this point, with fisheries being managed under one paradigm and mining and uh, such under others. So it's been the biggest kind of challenge in the high seas has just been the, the various uh, groups involved and they don't all kind of work uh, in concert. That's partly what drove this high seas mapping work that we were doing. But uh, there's hope for that. You know, the UN is talking about a high seas governance agreement and there are preparatory meetings happening as we speak uh, working towards that. And so uh, you know, certainly the, some of the goals for protection are, are quite unreachable without some high seas protections. Uh, there's only so many waters in different countries' EEZs that are available, <laughs> and even if we protected our entirety of everyone's EEZs, you know, we just can't do it without some high seas protection. And so, um, looking forward to seeing how that develops as well. Thanks, Beth. Um, I. I, I absolutely agree with you I guess this is why there's such a strong focus on the on trying to um, to get consent adopt the high seas implementing agreement I think we've had already two prep comps and there's a third one on the way with dates to be confirmed so definitely if you're interested in, on, on, on stronger measures or effective measures around high seas con uh, conservation please uh, do get in touch with us either through the MPA Action Group or through uh, the, this, uh, the, the High Seas Alliance, uh, who, who also does a lot of work on high seas conservation. So I'm um, going down the list of questions, um, and there are a few more questions that, that need to be addressed still. Um, there's another question here on WebGIS, Ludo, from Roy Martinez. Would you like to put the question forward? Yes, I think this is a question specifically for Andreas, but I will uh, we'll, uh, read it up. So Andreas, um, Roy is asking, which technologies you suggest to use for storage of large amount of data like EIS and VMS? Uh, so what kind of storage did you use? Uh, what kind of spatial database servers? Uh, so it's a rather technical question, uh, but could you give us a heads up on what kind of uh, tools you're using for that? Yeah, thanks for this question. Yeah, I cannot give a general recommendation, but I can tell you what we use. Uh, we are completely open source house, so all the software we are using, which you see, is based on open source, source technology because we believe in this and we think it's, it's required to promote this as a future challenge. And from an open source technology, we use here a Postgres database, which has a special design, uh, highly optimized for our problem to have an extreme fast access on this information. We can run this on a quite low cost server. The server alone costs not below $2,000 and handles all this data back to 2009 in real time. Uh, in the front end, we use an um, Leaflet and other technology which is customized from our side. So it's a Postgres database in the background. Does this answer the question? I hope so. Otherwise, uh, they could uh, uh, ask another clarifying question in the chat or box. He, uh, we have or you contact we me directly by email. Absolutely. That's an even better uh, advice, <laughs> Andreas. So <laughs> I, 
There is a lot of questions for you, Andreas, and this is the last one that we have received in the text box. And then we will go to uh, closing uh, comments from you and Beth and Ludo uh, before we end the session. So the last question I have is from uh, Jonas, and his question is, uh, how has the coverage of AIS data been improved during the last years? I heard that the number of receivers on land and satellite have increased a lot during the last years, but I have not gotten any good info And in how much of the cover has been improved. So I think that's a really specific question for you, Andrea. The, the coverage has extremely improved. And we can tell this because we know the data back to 2009 now since, uh, I think, nine months now. Our provider Orbcom has 12 satellites in the air which continuously register um, IS vessels and send them down to downlink and we get them immediately in our server. So its improvement is good from a tech technical point, global coverage is basically insured. Uh, from a law situation and policy situation, it's a bit different. European waters are extreme good because the European Union demands uh, coverage for all vessels down to 40 meter meanwhile. And uh, in US, something similar is coming, but in Asia, it looks a bit different from a policy point. But technically, extreme good coverage now. Thank you, Andrea. So we're coming down to the last few minutes of our webinar session. So in closing, I'm just going to go um, through the panelists again through to ask any last advice to the people who are on the webinar on using GIS tools for ocean advocacy. We'll start maybe with uh, with Beth. Are you any closing remarks, Beth? No, I just want to say thank you to you guys. I think that. Um, you know, trying to cover all the uses of GIS was certainly never going to happen. And I just hope that maybe between the two of us and what Ludo discussed, hopefully folks are seeing that the breadth and width of GIS as a tool in the uh, community is growing exponentially. And as more people uh, come into the field and use it, I think it's, it's really powerful. And uh, I always enjoy seeing how other folks are using it uh, as well. Thank you, Beth. Ludo, any closing remarks? Yeah, um, also thanks a lot for for your attention, uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, I, I think I, I made my mark earlier, but I, I still want to emphasize it. It's, it's start with your question. Um, don't start from technology or data availability. Start with your question. See how it lines up with your uh, with your call to action, with your opportunities to act, basically. And from there on, build your tools. And make also sure that your GIS specialists are aware of that. And as a GIS specialist, make aware that you're uh, aware of the of the the. Uh, advocacy agenda of your organization. Learn from each other. Thank you, Ludo. And uh, we'll go to Andreas. Andreas, there's been a lot of interest from your presentation today. Any any parting words? Any last remarks for the audience? Yeah. If there's so much interest, feel free to contact me directly by email or via our website navama.com. I'm two more days in the office and I'm in vacation for two weeks, so don't be disappointed if the reply comes later. Uh, so thank you to all and I hope I can uh, encourage you to use this IS data and other vessel data for your marine analytics because our vision is to create a transparency of a public good which should be protected by all and should be owned by all and uh, this was the origin of this technology development and this is what we try to achieve with WWS together. So thank you very much for listening and maybe support. This. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea. So on behalf of the MP Action Agenda, MPA News, and the EBM Tool Network, we'd just like to thank you all for participating and putting forward all your great questions. Um, we, will be have, we will have the slides uh, available for download. They're very large to send around by email, so we would prefer if you go and download them through mpaaction.org or uh, go through Open Channels. Open Channels will have the presentation, uh, the whole session, webinar session available for you to listen to some of the points again or some parts of the uh, presentation that you perhaps have missed, uh, maybe due to bad connections or internet, internet connections. So thank you everybody for participating. And uh, just a small plug, our next webinar uh, from the NPA Action, that which is also going to be uh, shared via Open Channels, is on the best practices for shark and ray tourism um, uh, next month with Andy Cornish and the Manta Trust uh, from the NWWF. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.